This is chapter 12, and to begin with, we're going to just do an overview of the nervous system and the organization of the nervous system. We know that anatomically, the nervous system can be divided up into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord, and it integrates and coordinates uh, the sensory data and uh, issues motor commands. And the central nervous system is also responsible for your intelligence and your memory and your emotion. The peripheral nervous system is the pathway for communication between the central nervous system and the rest of the body. So the peripheral nervous system includes all of the neural tissue outside of the central nervous system. There are nerves, which are bundles of axons that carry the sensory information uh, from receptors to the central nervous system. And there are also uh, nerves that carry motor commands from the central nervous system out to effectors. These nerves, if they are entering and exiting the brain, are called cranial nerves. And uh, if these nerves are attached to the spinal cord, then they're called spinal nerves. The nervous system can also be divided up into functional divisions, and the two functional divisions are the afferent division and the efferent division. The afferent division brings sensory information towards the central nervous system from the receptors that are in the tissues and organs of your body. Receptors are sensory structures that can detect changes in the internal environment, like they can detect changes in pH or oxygen levels, or they can respond to the presence of specific stimuli, like pain or pressure. The efferent division carries motor commands from the central nervous system to muscles and glands, and muscles and glands are called effectors. Effectors are the target organs which respond by doing something. So muscles would contract, glands would secrete. The efferent division can be divided into two subdivisions, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is the branch of the efferent division that controls your skeletal muscles. The somatic nervous system can be voluntary or involuntary. When it's voluntary, the contractions are under your conscious control and you are telling your skeletal muscles to contract. When your somatic nervous system acts involuntarily, the contractions are simple or complex, automatic responses that are directed at the subconscious level. For example, a reflex. A reflex can be a very simple automatic response, or it could be a more complex automatic response. But nonetheless, it's at the subconscious level, and it's an automatic response of your skeletal muscles. The second subdivision of the efferent division is the autonomic nervous system. The effectors of the autonomic nervous system include smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. The autonomic nervous system provides an automatic and involuntary response. The autonomic nervous system includes two subdivisions as well, which are called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions. So let's take a look at this chart here so we can map out the organization of the nervous system. We'll start with the sensory receptors. There are basically three different types of sensory receptors. There's a special sensory receptor, and the special sensory receptors are found in your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, uh, and they help to monitor smell, taste, vision, balance, and hearing. The second type of receptor are visceral sensory receptors. These are sensory receptors that are found in your internal organs, and they'll monitor things that are going on inside your organs, like pH changes, oxygen level changes, or pain or pressure, things like that. And the third type of receptor is a somatic sensory receptor. 
These are found in skeletal muscles, joints, and skin surfaces, and they can also detect things like pain, vibration, temperature, uh, proprioception, and things like that. These receptors will generate action potentials in sensory neurons, and these sensory neurons will travel through the peripheral nervous system towards the central nervous system. So they travel in nerves towards either the brain or the spinal cord. This portion of the peripheral nervous system is called the afferent division. If the sensory information enters into the spinal cord, it will have to ascend to get to the brain. And once in the brain, the information will be integrated in with other areas of the brain, it will be processed, and from that sensory data, the brain will then determine whether a motor command needs to be issued. So the motor command then will be sent through the efferent division. The efferent division includes both the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system will issue commands to skeletal muscles, and the skeletal muscles will contract. The autonomic nervous system will issue commands either through the parasympathetic division, which is your rest and digest division, or through the sympathetic division, which is your fight or flight division. Either way, these commands will be sent to the same effectors. These effectors include smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, glands, and adipose tissue. Neural tissue consists of two different kinds of cells. There are neurons and there are neural glia. Neurons, like the one you see here, are the basic functional units of the nervous system and they can conduct nerve impulses. Neural glia are supporting cells that you don't see here, but they help to separate the neurons, they protect the neurons and support them, and they can also act as phagocytes. The neuron contains a cell body, uh, which contains a nucleus and some organelles, but it doesn't have any centrioles. So this means that no mitosis can take place, and so none of your neurons are able to divide. So basically, if a neuron is damaged uh, and it is destroyed, you will not be able to replace that neuron. There are some neural stem cells that persist in adults, but they're inactive, except in the nose, uh, in the olfactory receptors, and in the hippocampus, where you have memory storage occurring. In the cell body of the neuron, there are clusters of rough endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes, which are called nissel bodies, and they give the cell body its gray color. The cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus is called the perikaryon. The perikaryon also contains neurofilaments and neurotubules that are similar to the microfilaments and microtubules of other cells. The dendrites here are projections from the cell body which receive incoming signals. The cell membrane of these dendrites are sensitive to uh, many different types of stimulation, including chemical, mechanical, or electrical stimulation. And this stimulation will eventually and potentially lead to an action potential. The axon is a projection from the cell body that carries outgoing signals towards synaptic terminals or synaptic knobs. The cell membrane surrounding the axon is called the axolemma. We divide the axon up into different parts. The axon hillock is a thickened region where the cell body starts to become the axon, so it's basically right at the base of the axon. And um, then that leads into the initial segment, which is part of the axon that's attached to the cell body by the axon hillock. The axon might branch and communicate with multiple cells, and these branches are called collaterals. 
And then there are fine extensions at the end of those branches that form the telodendria. The telodendria then end at the synaptic terminal, otherwise known as the synaptic knob. So the synaptic terminal is basically the tips of those telodendria. And that's where the neuron is going to communicate with another cell. The synapse is a special site where the neuron communicates with another cell. So it's where two cells meet. The cell sending the message has the synaptic terminal and we call this the presynaptic cell. The cell that receives the message is called the postsynaptic cell. Chemicals are released from the synaptic terminal and they will bind to the postsynaptic cell and affect it one way or another, either stimulate it or inhibit it. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are found in synaptic vesicles that are in the synaptic terminal. This postsynaptic cell can be a neuron or it can be another cell type. The postsynaptic cell could be a smooth muscle or cardiac muscle, or it could be a gland or even adipose tissue. If the synapse is between the presynaptic cell, which is a neuron, and a muscle cell, then we call it the neuromuscular junction. If the synapse occurs between that presynaptic neuron and a gland, then we call it the neuroglandular junction. The neurotransmitters that I mentioned are produced in the cell body. These neurotransmitters are bundled up into little vesicles and then they travel down through the cytoplasm of the axon, so through the axoplasm, towards the synaptic terminal. The movement of materials from the cell body to the synaptic terminal is called antrograde. The movement of materials from the synaptic knob to the cell body is called retrograde. Sometimes viruses uh, like rabies can travel in a retrograde movement towards the cell body and cause a lot of damage. This neuron here that you're seeing is a common neuron in the body that's called a multipolar neuron. And the reason why it's multipolar is because there are multiple processes extending away from the cell body. So we see all these dendrites and then we see the one axon. Multipolar neurons are found in the central nervous system, but also all motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system are multipolar. A multipolar neuron is just one type of neuron that we classify Let's look at the other classifications of neurons. So an anaxonic neuron is a neuron that's small and really has no anatomical clues to distinguish the dendrites from the axons. They are located in the brain and also in special sensory organs. So when you look at this picture, you really can't tell which ones are the dendrites, which is the axon. Another common classification of neuron is the unipolar neuron. Una means one. So there's basically just one pole coming off of the cell body. Then extending from the pole on one side is the dendrite and on the other side of the pole is the axon. So the dendrite and the ax axon are continuous and then the cell body just lies off to one side. All the sensory neurons of the peripheral nervous system are unipolar neurons. The bipolar neuron is another classification of neurons and it has two processes. There's one dendrite coming off of one end of the cell body and then there's one axon coming off another part of the cell body. So the cell body is between the dendrite and the axon. And we find bipolar neurons in the eye and in the ear. One more type of neuron that I want to discuss are called interneurons. 
Interneurons are otherwise known as association neurons. Interneurons are mostly located within the brain and the spinal cord. They are located between sensory neurons and motor neurons. The more complex the response is to any given stimulus, the greater number of interneurons there will be between the sensory and the motor neurons. Neuroglia are those supporting cells that help to support the neurons. And neuroglia are found both in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. But the central nervous system has the greatest diversity of neuroglial cells. The neuroglia of the central nervous system include the ependymal cells. Ependymal cells line the central canal of the spinal cord and they also line the ventricles of the brain. These ependymal cells produce a fluid that's called cerebral spinal fluid. The cilia on these ependymal surfaces then help to circulate that cerebral spinal fluid through the central canal and the ventricles. The epithelial cells that line the central canal and the ventricles are called the ependyma. The ependyma in adults contain stem cells that can produce additional neurons. Cells called oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system produce a waxy material called myelin. Myelin covers portions of axons. Where the axon is not covered by the myelin, we call that a node. So a node is an unmyelinated gap on a myelinated axon. We also call these nodes of Ranvier. Where the myelin is um, on the segment of the axon, we call these portions of the axon internodes. So internodes are the lengths of the axon that is covered with myelin. In the central nervous system, there is white matter and gray matter. White matter are areas of the central nervous system that have axons that are covered with myelin because the myelin has a whitish appearance and so the white matter is uh, an area that has a lot of myelin. The gray matter then in the central nervous system are areas that are dominated by the cell bodies of neurons. And if you remember, in the cell bodies were the uh, nissel bodies, and the nissel bodies gave the cell bodies a gray appearance. So gray matter then in the central nervous system are areas dominated by the neuron cell bodies. So in the central nervous system, the oligodendrocytes make the myelin, and in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells make the myelin. The Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system are the most important neural glial cells. They cover every axon outside the central nervous system, except for some of the neurons in the autonomic nervous system, which we'll talk about later. Another type of neural glia in the peripheral nervous system are satellite cells. These satellite cells surround the neuron cell bodies in ganglia. Satellite cells help supply nutrients to the surrounding neurons, and they also act as protective cushioning cells to the neurons. I mentioned that these satellite cells are surrounding the neuron cell bodies in ganglia. Ganglia are in the peripheral nervous system, and that is where there are clusters of neuron cell bodies uh, in the peripheral nervous system. So remember, um, these neurons, um, they run side by side to form nerves. And so where there are a lot of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, they kind of cluster together, and then we call these areas the ganglia.